Step into the dusty trails of the Old West, where gunfights echo through the canyons and legends were born. Today, I invite you to saddle up and join me on a journey back in time with the classic film in Old Arizona. Released in 1928, and our last stop in our 1928 class, this cinematic gem not only marked a turning point in the evolution of Westerns, but also boasts a unique claim to fame. You see, in Old Arizona was the first feature film to be filmed outdoors using the new movie tone sound on film technology. Capturing the rugged beauty of the Southwest with unprecedented authenticity. Now, for a touch of intrigue to the cinematic epic. Originally, director Raul Walsh was set to play the iconic role of Cisco Kid. But as fate would have it, a jackrabbit jumped through the windshield, injuring himself in a car accident paving the way to a relatively unknown actor at the time, Warner Baxter, to step into the spotlight and deliver a performance that would make history. So as you settle in to experience the charm of in old Arizona, remember that you're not just watching a film, you're witnessing the birth of a new era in Hollywood, where technology and talent merge to bring the Wild West to life in a way never seen before. Enjoy the ride, because this is in old Arizona. Well, you can kiss that goodbye. When this here Cisco kid does a job, he does it right. I wish I had my hands on him. I do a good job for myself. We've got to form a vigilante committee and hang him to the highest tree. And I'm going to start it. They say he'll shoot you as quick as he'll look at you. But if I ever meet him face to face, I'll kill him like I would a dog. What? You would kill somebody? 1928's in old Arizona. I'm shooting quick and straight, my friend. That's what they said in the film. I thought I'd say it to you here. I was going to stooge off right away what I thought of this movie, but we'll hold it for initial reactions. Uh, tagline, you hear what you see while, enjoy, while enjoying in old Arizona. The other one, as far as the movie concerned, a charming, happy-go-lucky bandit in old Arizona plays cat and mouse with the sheriff trying to catch him while he romances a local beauty. Oh, yes, that Dorothy Burgess, Miss Tonya Marie. Uh, uh, she was a beauty. She did pop off the screen. I'll give him that. Um, yeah. Directed <clears throat> by Raul Woosh, Walsh in Irving Cummings. This movie came out on Christmas Day, 1928. It is the last movie in our, I guess, our catalog of films in 1928. Alongside me, as always, is my buddy, William. William, how you doing, man? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. How you doing, Rob? I'm doing all right, man. So I just want to remind our viewers that this was one of your draft choices. Um, I just, I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> uh, no, I just, I, I, I kid my best I'm friend. Pretty, yeah, no, this, this, we should just do all hard hitting questions for this one. <laughs> should be nothing but hard hitting questions. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely correct. That, that's, yeah, that's my uh, initial reaction. I think we could get through and everybody would understand why for those that keep up with us. Uh, this movie was about an hour, 38 minutes in length. We got Warner Baxter. He played Cisco Kid. Edmund Lowe came in as Sergeant Mickey Dunn. And then the final marquee one, like we've already stated, was Dorothy Burgess for Tonya Maria. I also like to add who distributed this. It was Fox Film Corporation because we're starting to learn more about the studios at that time. Um, and it's important to note that we've only had, I believe, one film or two films that had the same distributor. So you would think at that time it'd be more of like two or three big head ups and they're pushing it out there, but there was a lot more even in 1920, 28. Well, I'm going to give you the floor. You drafted this one. And let me just say, before I give my initial reaction, I want to say that at the end of the movie, I was invested. The last 10 minutes, they get me there, right? Mm -hmm. Now let's get your initial reactions leading up to that oh you you just want leading up to that so you just want the shit part of the movie well just give me your initial <laughs> right. reactions no. of the movie. <laughs> no so listen i i was expecting this to be a western this was a melodrama that you would find on channel 11 at 1 30 you know you get done watching prices right in the local news and then this is what's on afterwards um so my initial reaction is man this just was not very good um the acting was just weird the dialogue was bad um there's some funny parts like there's some real funny lines in here but they all come with this real awkward delivery 
So, um, you know, like even in the parts where I'm laughing, it's almost at the movie and not with the movie. So my initial reactions are this is not very good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I put on here in the notes, shooting quick and straight. This movie I sucked. <laughs> um, yeah. it, it did. It wasn't very good. And I, I even had a buddy of mine stop by for the last 10 minutes. He's like, what are you doing? I <clears throat> We watched the last 10 minutes together. And he's like, this isn't too bad. I'm like, you're seeing the best part of this movie. You know, my initial reaction was this, Will. There's an old saying in filmmaking, especially as they get better at this craft, and I do think at this per this time, um, it, we try to give the benefit of the doubt. This movie was so far off the plot of the movie. Um, like you said, I almost think this is an insult to the to the the soaps that come on after the the local news because I my grandma watches those the young Naresses from twelve thirty to one thirty and one thirty to two is the bold and beautiful and they have their flaws don't get me wrong but at least 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 there's no wasted scenes hmm. and this whole movie felt like just one big wasted scene after another right? Yep. We get the plot point of the movie right away. And that's supposed to be the thing that drives the narrative and gets you going throughout this film. And then you spend 10, 15 minutes at, on uh, the chemistry between two characters when there's no chemistry between the characters, because like you said, they're doing this weird acting thing. Um, yeah. it, it, it was like, I don't know. It was like peanut butter and a wet fart. It just didn't go together, dude. It was it was not working for me. I, I don't know. No. You, you hit it right on it. What that thought though of like like I remember watching um, the Dark Knight, and I remember thinking to myself, "Wow, there is very few, if any, wasted time on screen in this movie." Right. What's your thought process on that? When me saying that to you, did you kind of get that same vibe? My, I want to lead with a tiny defense, right? Okay. And that is this entire movie is talky, right? Like it's all, it's all live. It's all them having their, you know, dialogue right there, except for the one, one scene at the very end where something weird was going on there. Um, but the, my defense of their um, dialogue and this kind of scenes feeling wasted is that they were limited to to having these long scenes of dialogue in places and throwing off the kind of feel and the flow of the movie because they were trying to execute the full you know the full dialogue um, throughout the movie rather than you know dubbing it in later. So um, I think that would be my defense of kind of having a lot of scenes where they sit down together like in the barber shop, which is you know five minutes too long. Or, you know, the first time you meet Tonya and it's probably 10 minutes too long and every scene's just a little bit too long. But I think it's because they're trying to, you know, they're trying to execute a technology and they're not familiar with it yet. And there's maybe not just that they're not familiar, but they're limited uh, to these types of scenes. Yeah, I. that's why I love that we're doing this show because that, that, that went right over my head. You're right. I... There is a defense to be had because this technology is so new and they're marketing it as, you know, what you hear is what you see um, mm -hmm. and what you see is what you hear type thing. They're marketing this as the, and it was, this was the first 100% all talking movie in the United States, states where majority of this film is made outside. Um, that is a huge task to take on. Now, when you do something like that, you either have to have a lot of scenes Right. Yep. To keep up with the pacing of what this movie you wanted it to be, what this movie needs to be in order to be successful. Um, it just the technology audio didn't match the technology video or film um, to make for a great movie. Now, I say that and for all of its flaws and we'll get there. But like I did stooge off to you earlier, I thought the ending I did still find myself going compelled a little bit, of, just enough to be like, all right, how's this going to play out? Like, how is this going to, what's yeah. the, and I actually enough thought that the ending was cleverly done almost mm -hmm. to a point where I had to sit back and go, was this movie actually good? And then I said, <laughs> no, 
They just, they found a way, but I could see you in 1928. I could see somebody leaving the theater for the first time, seeing an all talky film and out, you know, the women got a little bit of the romance. The men got a little bit of the Cowboys, um, mm -hmm. you know, leaving there. And then with that ending, being, being content and satisfied with what you just saw. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the movie's book ended by some pretty good imagery. Um, one of the notes I kind of had was just like the imagery, they always have very nice settings, especially when they're like doing the outside, like the cattle scene, that's it's pretty beautifully shot. The first scene when he's kind of watching the stagecoach and chasing it down, like I thought that was beautifully shot. Um, but it's, it always just feels like it's there to be beautiful. It's not there for anything because the whole middle of the movie just has nothing to do with him being a, a stagecoach robber or a thief. It's just him being in love. In <laughs> and love. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it, it just, it just ends up not working as a whole uh, by the end of the movie. Well, and it's on, it's predicated on the fact that this is a cat and mouse game and there's no cat and mouse game. You know what I mean? There's a cat and mouse game means that there's a chase, there's a pursuit and there's an almost mm. capture, and then there's uh, an, an escape, and then there's the chase again, and almost captured. Like the circus did a better job of of really, you know, the cat and mouse game, right? Yeah. Um, this is just like I, I'm not even. This is big. Is this one long day? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Right, I, and I think no. it is. And if it is, it really tells you a little bit about Tonya. <laughs> I mean. She had a very <laughs> impactful, eventful, fulfilling day. So good for yeah. her. Um, we'll get to that. Uh, let's take some things to note. Things to note. This was the first all talking sound on film feature shot outdoors. We've stated that. Raul Walsh. All right. He was one of the directors. Now, he was the sole director um, at the beginning. There wasn't going to be a, another guy. Now, what happened here? He was the original Cisco kid. He was casted as the Cisco kid. So as well as being the director... Um, and the actor, on a drive home from Los Angeles to Utah, a jackrabbit jumped through the windshield of Walsh's car with both the rabbit and the broken glass hitting Walsh in the face, leaving him mm -hmm. to have to wear an eye patch and obviously having some scars on his face. Uh, mm -hmm. The damage to Walsh's right eye necessity replacing him to be replaced in this movie uh, again by Warner Baxter. So they had to do some reshoots, and Raul Walsh wasn't able to direct for a certain amount of time, so they had to bring in Irving Cummings. Um, so now that's why you get this co-director co -director, uh, 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 title there. And yeah. interesting enough, just a side note to a side note, is safety glass was then used in Windows uh, the next year. So, oh, wow. Okay. So it was, it was well, such a big news for that. <clears throat> Yeah. Another quick side note. It's interesting then because I'm looking at this movie was nominated for a few Academy Awards and I'm seeing that Irving Cummings is the only one that was um, nominated, not Raul Walsh. Walsh. So that's kind of interesting. Well, maybe maybe that's what happened. Maybe they started it. It was Raul Walsh. And then because mm. of what happened, they had to Irving Cummings basically came in and retook over everything. And they probably just gave him credit on the front end. But um, yeah. We, what do you have it still in front of you? What would, what categories was this? Uh, yeah. Um, nominated so, for uh, nominated in best picture, best actor in a <clears throat> leading role, best director, best writing and best cinematography. Did so they... five pretty big categories. <laughs> what the hell wanna, do we know? You want to know now what it won for? Oh, it actually did get <laughs> what, a win. It won one. Which one did it win for? Best actor in a leading role. No. By which guy? By by Warren Baxter? By Warner Baxter, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Dude, <laughs> I read, man. I read right. that a little bit ago, and I was shocked. Wow. I was absolutely blown away. Well, then you know what? I, I'll, I'm to defend you here. Uh, you've earned a little bit more street cred again for your draft pick. Um, so good, good. You, you get a little bit more equity with me, friend. Uh, last <laughs> antidote that I have, if you don't have, if you have any other ones, um, was no scenes were, of this movie were actually shot in Arizona. Um, oh, okay. Utah and California got all of it. So, Gotcha. That's not shocking. Um, no, nope, Hollywood's. Yeah. Now, now been, it would be what? shot in New Mexico. 
Yep, you're right. Hollywood's been lying since day one. Um, do you have any other notes, things that you thought were interesting before we get into the heart of the film? Um, no, I don't. I don't think so. I think we can talk about the stuff that I wanted to talk about when we're kind of in the scenes. So okay. Um, you know, if I, I, I we have a format and a structure, everybody. Usually, you know. We're going to get through this, so just bear with us. We're going to make it as entertaining as we possibly can. Uh, again, we start off with another overture. Again, I'm sitting there pressing the button going, is this just a black screen? Did I just spend $4 on this movie and I'm going to get sound only? Because um, I, I, I signed up for the silent era. That's okay. What I didn't sign up was audio only. Um, yep. We start off. Now, thank goodness the, the overture only lasts about a minute. 15 we get there quickly like i said this movie isn't isn't long and thank god it's not if you imagine like sitting through this for like another 30 minutes it would feel a lot longer right um yeah opening scene church bells over a garden to a husband and a wife sitting on a bench waiting for their stagecoach to arrive um i was a little worried i must say in the beginning like the first five ten minutes of the audio because it, it was almost inaudible to me. I don't know what you found, but just that opening scene, I thought it was cool the way they had like all the background noise to kind of give us some layers and depth to our, our field of vision. But like, I was worried because everything wasn't mixed well. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I don't think, you know, I just recently updated my uh, sound system. So I've got some surround sound. I didn't have any issues. Okay. Um, everything, I think it all sounded pretty good, but I'm also not remember. I don't remember it standing out is what I should well, say. I think the only reason I remember standing out is because as the stagecoach arrives, there's the, 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 the couple sitting on the bench, right? They're getting ready to mm -hmm. go in. Um, and then they, he walks up to another gentleman and everybody seems to be talking over each other. And yeah. so that part was like, okay, either they needed to pause and let one at a time go, or they needed to kind of tone down the background noise a little bit, bring up. But again, like you said, this could have been just on my TV. This could have just been something that I was struggling with because I don't have the surround sound. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, like I said, I don't remember it standing out, so. Okay. Um, yeah. Fair enough. We move on. Now, I will say I didn't do every scene. A lot of times I do a lot of the scenes because they're so important to the plot points of what we're doing. Given right. what we talked about, I didn't have to do that with this movie. So just kind of, if right. you feel like I skipped over something, just stop me and we'll, we'll, we'll talk on it. Sure. Um, the next thing I thought of importance that kind of moves the story along is we get a close up of a flyer that reads $5,000 reward for Cisco kid. It's being held in the hand by Cisco kid himself. He laughs immediately at it and rips it up. Mm -hmm. We're yeah. off to the races now. <laughs> yeah, no, I thought it was a decent, you know, I thought it was a pretty good scene. Nice little, you know, laughing in the face of the law and just, you know, a now classic type of uh, indifference from the, the main anti-hero, right? Yeah, and you know, right away, again, I feel like I'm watching this movie and I'm thinking, okay, they're showing the bad guy. Um, he's going to be the antagonist of this movie. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, right. I, 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 again, it, it could have went either way. Cause I know a lot of times, you know, the antagonist or the bad guy is the protagonist and vice versa, um, which I right. think is an interesting kind of like narrative on society in America as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. Cause I, a lot of times, like I side note, I watch suits. You and I discussed suits before. A lot of times you'll watch an episode and you'll be watching and you're thinking to yourself, all right, in a normal world, Harvey and Mike would be like bad guys here. <laughs> like, but right. in our world of watching this show, they're characters that we love because we've seen their growth. We're, we're, yeah. we're almost like allowing them to do what they're doing because we know they intend well, but they're actually oh. pursuing bad. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what we do when we read stories or we watch TV or whenever we engage with the story, we always, we put ourselves into the character's shoes. So it's hard not to sympathize with the, with the story we're watching. I mean, the, the example I always bring up and it's probably, you know, <laughs> oh, well, but it's breaking bad. Right. I mean, we all sympathize with Walter White. 
the I think the whole exercise of uh, the, here's a side note for you. The whole exercise of Breaking Bad is to um, see how far I th- think you can take the viewer um, yeah. to s- see what depth you can go to before you start to say, eh, maybe I don't want this guy to, you know, succeed at the end of the day. So, <clears throat> yeah, maybe we'll do a, a breakdown of that in the future because I was lost as not a viewer as somebody who was rooting for Walter White. Um, mm-hmm. But we're, I don't want to get too far off track with that. So that's interesting that maybe we are on a little bit. We're seeing that story a little bit differently. Um, all right. S- episode for uh, scene four, Cisco kid robs the stagecoach that the old married couple was on. Um, they're now out in the middle of the desert there. And we see Cisco kid and he, he robs the stagecoach of a Wells Fargo box. But right away, this is now where we get this information that although he's a bad guy, he's a bad guy who cares. And here's what he, they do. He doesn't rob any of the any of them individually. Okay. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, there's a scene in the scene he's asked to bring the pretty girl closer to him. He asks for her brooch. I believe I'm saying that word correctly, but it's like a brooch that the uh, people used to wear back in the day. It was almost like a button, a fancy button. Um, and he pays the girl for it. And then he sends the stage coach on their way. So nobody's shot. There's no harm done. Um, it's just giving us some, basically some exposition and some characteristic details on Cisco, the kid. Sure. A little bit of Robin hood here, a little bit, of you know, doesn't want to steal from, you know, people below him or even with him. He just wants to take the money from, uh, you know, the people who have all of the money. So a little bit of that going on, which, you know, initially we kind of, maybe his intention isn't exactly, um, by the time we get to the next couple of scenes, I think we realize that maybe that viewpoint might be a little bankrupt, but. <laughs> good, good word, by the way. Um, I, uh, it, it made me, f- uh, I, I thought about the movie Hell or High Water. I don't know if you've seen that movie oh, sure. or not, but, oh, yeah. you know, basically robbing the, 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 corporate greed to pay back for the, you know, for the, for the common man. Um, I want, I did have a note here and it feels like maybe you've kind of alluded to it that maybe you feel differently than me up until this point. And I will say, I thought the movie got better. Um, but up until this point, I felt like the filmmaking was a little amateurish. Mm -hmm. Okay. Especially when we got to like, as soon as Cisco the Kid came on, because I, I like the kind of the, the depth of field that we get in the first shot with the stagecoach. I like the way that's shot and set up. Yeah. But we get Cisco the Kid, he reveals the reward, and then all of a sudden we get like the desert in the background. I just felt like that whole scene where he's robbing the stagecoach, it, it was very, it was like, I felt like it needed four or five more angles. You know, I mm-hmm. thought it needed flushed out more. Um, it just felt yeah. like they're like, Hey, we're on this scene. And again, to your, like your defense earlier is they're probably trying to capture that audio. They're yeah. probably trying to figure out how to get clean audio. So they just don't move people a lot. And yeah, I get it. But to me, it, it hurts your overall art, your overall project. So I don't know what you yeah. think. No, I think you're, you're spot on. I think their intention is to try to be as authentic as possible with the sound and in doing so, it kind of de-authentizes, if that's a word, um, it, the rest of the, the artwork going on. So you, you limit yourself in certain ways so you can focus on one, um, you know, one of the senses, one of the aspects of the film. And they do a pretty good job with it, uh, with the sound, but it limits the rest of the movie in pretty important ways. Yeah, it does. It does. All right, we move on. We get to those bankrupt scenes like you were talking about. Uh, we jump ahead now to gentlemen, a, a bunch of American soldiers now. They are, I, I'm not sure what the name of this city was or this town. Did you pick up on it? No. Yeah. It's old Arizona. Let's just call it, it that. We're in old Arizona. All right. So <coughs> we, we have the, the, the next scene of, of note that's worthy of noting about is we get introduced to Sergeant Mickey Dunn. Okay, and he walks into um, where the captain, his kind of captain's um, 
offices. They've just now said that uh, Cisco the Kid is out in old Arizona, out in the valleys, in the shadows out there, kind of doing his thing, that the stagecoach just got robbed. Um, so, and that there's a reward for it. So the captain gives his orders for Sergeant Mickey Dunn and his men to capture Cisco the Kid, uh, or Cisco Kid, from Wolf Country, dead or alive. Right, so now we know that there's a price tag on his head. We know exactly how much it is, and we know that it doesn't have to be alive. We can get this man dead. So now, right away, we're off to the races again, right? Yeah, we're no. not. As <laughs> nope. a matter of fact, I would actually argue that the moment we get to the barber is the way the moment this movie really shows its face for what it's going to be the rest of the movie. Yep. No, this is right. Um, the the barber shop. I think maybe halfway through. You're kind of just, you can, you can justify up that first five to 10 minutes where you're learning a little bit more about Cisco um, and how he is not thinking. <laughs> he's either not thinking all the way through, or he's telling himself lies about who he's robbing because I mean, the, the, we learn about the barber losing $87 to Cisco, the kid, and he says he's going to get him the money back and he gives him a dollar at the end of the scene. Right. So, um, you know that you can there's a little bit learned here but there's so much time spent in this barber shop and you know you get a little bit of cisco the kid and mickey together but it's you know it's just so much time spent on this and it's like you could have cut this scene in half and still got the same same effect and probably half again after that um you're right i i I, technically i i thought the opening shot in the barber scene was really cool You know, you got the barber cutting the man in the background through the mirror um, while all these talking heads are talking above him about, you know, Cisco the kid and who he is. And, you know, we need to get a vigilante group together to kind of go out there and capture this man. Meanwhile, Cisco the kid is the guy. I don't know if I keep calling Cisco the kid. Cisco kid is in the barber's chair getting cleaned up. And I was like, oh, that's it. Now, that's a good shot. So I thought, you know, he started, you know, playing a little bit more with that. Or maybe I just started paying attention to it more. But. Mm-hmm. At this part, Cisco Kid sits in barber chairs. Men discuss putting together a vigilante group. Did we ever get a moment where the vigilante group shows up and is giving him any confrontation along the way? No, we get the one scene of the the guys trying to get the group together with some weird Chinese, like I don't know, like two Chinese guys talking in the background. I don't know what the hell they were thinking putting that in there, but yeah, we'd never get any sort of payoff here from the, the vigilante group. Yeah. I just think it is going to be layered. I'm like, okay, okay. We're going to have, uh, you're going to have the American soldiers and Sergeant Mickey Dunn, which by the way, that guy right away. I didn't like that guy. I can tell you that much right now. Um, but I think we're going to get the the Americans. I like the way he rolls dice. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right, you already you already did a hard hitting question, dude. What was that? <laughs> Rolling that dice, man. We're gonna have to do one of these live. Um, we'll have to watch it live, <laughs> dude. So yeah, you're you're hundred percent correct though, hundred percent correct. I, it, the, the movie at this point, because I, I was thinking we were we were gonna get the vigilante group that kind of maybe got in the way of what the American soldiers were trying to do. I'm just gonna say this now. I actually think if this movie was remade, it could work. Like, it's yeah. interesting enough. It could be an exciting film, especially if you keep the ending that we get. I think it works, yeah. man. Mm-hmm. So there's something yeah, no, there. I, it just. Yeah. No, I mean, we see there's Westerns like this, right? I think Helen, uh, Helen Highwater is a good example. There was a movie a few years ago with Christian Bale and uh, Ben Foster, Hostels. I don't Hostels. know if you ever saw that one. Um that kind of has that same, like, you know, couple of different groups trying to accomplish something and, you know, getting in the way of each other. So wait a minute, um, wait, 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 yeah. wait a minute. That, that's called Hostels? Yeah. The one with Three- uh, Rosalind Pike and Christian Bale and Ben Foster, wow. I believe. I thought because they were in a Western 310 to Yuma. Yep. Also, a and they did Western, another but... movie called Host. Oh, I did see that one. You're right. I did see that one. That movie's yeah. great. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I I mean, we see stuff like we see Westerns all the time, especially over the last 20 years when the the intention behind the Western has shifted a little bit into like, hey, like maybe there's some moral bankruptcy behind the way, you know, 
we've we've moralized the wild west for 150 years and maybe that was a little bit uh you know morally bankrupt like i said sure. so yeah, yeah i mean it, the wild west gets a conscience you know um mm -hmm. back to cisco kids sitting in the barber chair we finally get out of that um and the next scene of again it goes on for a while there we get to learn a little bit of who Cisco kid is through, through conversation. You know, you do, like you said, he, he's going to pay back this money. Just give me a great bath. Um, in walks Sergeant, Sergeant Mickey Dunn. He walks in the barbershop as well and gets his hair cut. Cisco pays for his cut and he ends up giving a dollar to the barber. Basically what you see here is that they don't really know what Cisco kid looks like. They don't know who mm. he is. Although, a guy who looks like him's in that town stands out like a sore thumb to me. Um, but again, they're not, they're not, you know, they're not profiling anybody, which is good. Good on them for the 1928s. Um, yeah. But basically what we end up finding out after that, a short time after Cisco kid leaves the barbershop and so does Mickey Dunn is I think it's like a blacksmith or somebody that says to, says to yeah. uh, the sergeant, Hey, that man's hand that you just shook, that's Cisco kid. And now we're off to the races again. Yeah. Except for now. Right. Yeah. Is this the end of act one? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I think it is because when you, the next scene, right, we get, uh, we meet Tonya, Tonya, Tonya. however you say her name. So I thought I think it was that's Tonya kind of for a while. And then I looked it up. I was like, Oh, it's Tonya. So, yeah. So, I mean, this would be end of act one. I, I think I think you're right there. Cisco goes and we were introduced to the lovely, lovely Tonya. But one thing to keep in mind is that a man just snuck out of her place with his knowledge. Now, we've already learned throughout the, the movie that Cisco Kid loves this woman. Mm -hmm. Okay. He is excited to get back to her. He bought the brooch from the pretty girl earlier where we thought, like, where's this going to go? He buys pays for it, sends her on her way. He is loyal. He's in love with this woman. And right away we find out that she's not. And yeah. then we go on a 15 minute journey um, that kills the movie. I, I know we've, we've mentioned it, but it, it does. It takes anybody who's invested, you know, 25 minutes to this movie. It just, it just kills it for them. Um, and that's where, Today, you would lose people. I don't, I don't know how many people would stick along for the ride if they're not doing what we're doing, which is just trying to give it a yeah. fair, fair review. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, again, some redeeming parts of this scene, you know, you learn how much Cisco is in love with Tonya. You get some callback to that opening um, orchestra, you know, in the first few minutes because... Uh, I'm pretty sure the song that's playing is the same song. Um, and you you learn a little bit about um, her relationship with other people, which is, you know, pretty manipulative. Um, so you're, it's kind of, it's setting things up nicely if the scene wasn't so flipping boring, right? Yeah. It's just too long. It takes too long to get to its point. You get these little nuggets along the way, but it's just, it's not enough to redeem anything. It's just enough to, you can tell that they're trying to tell you a story, but they're just not doing it efficiently. Yeah. And I think the right word is bookends. Like I think you mentioned that they book in not just the movie nicely. They book in every scene nicely, right? You come in, you get right away. Why he's there, what he's done. He's missed her, who she is. We get all that. And then we get all this filler. And then we get a bookend about like, Hey, and this is where the next bookend comes in. Cisco sends Tonya after he's already sent the old woman to the local saloon to deliver a message to the sergeant because somehow he knows that the sergeant is going to come and find him and he'll be at the local saloon. Now, I, that's not too hard for me to put those pieces together. You know, mm -hmm. he, he knows that he, he pulled a fast one on him there. So eventually the sergeant's going to find out. Why not go to the local saloon where you think he's going to be? He sends Tonya there. She arrives and the two have kind of a war of wits and another scene that isn't as long as the previous one, but again, there's just a lot of things happening in there that just don't, they just don't feed the movie. 
Yeah, like the the guy who's staring her down the whole time in the background. Like, what's that there for? Like, we know she's appealing. We can see her. She's a very she's an attractive woman, and like the two leads are already attracted to her. We don't need the scene afterwards where he's you know talking to the we we just there's a bunch of stuff you don't need. So that uh, yeah, it just keeps recurring every scene. I mean, throughout. Yeah, and I, I, I feel like I'm being redundant here, but I don't want to I want to do the movie justice oh, and our audience no, just, justice. Yeah, no. Um, so once again, now Tony arrives back to the house. We see Cisco about ready to leave. They exchange flirting, and he gives a bunch of money to her, right? So mm. not just a bunch, but it looked like he almost emptied the bag, but I'm sure he kept on a sum. But yeah, he's emptying the bag. Again, he's getting ready to go to work. He's going to go... My understanding, and this is the part that I was a little, I think maybe I missed a a sentence or two. Did he go and steal those cattle? Yes. Okay. So we just don't see, we don't see the confrontation of it. We see the payout of it afterwards. It could be stealing cattle. It could be, you know, cattle were wild. So um, he could have been wrangling them up. He was doing it by himself. So that's not something you see very much, but either way, he's, they're not his cattle and he's making them his cattle making him his cattle because he's going to sell him as we learned down the road for four thousand dollars so he's gone within seconds man these guys are so close that cat and mouse game is so close he's right on his tail within seconds we get we get sergeant mickey dunn who shows up at the house now apparently knows exactly where she lives and he's there knocking on the door and they're having a little bit of a back and forth and uh for people that didn't like themselves or like each other at the at the saloon, we mm-hmm. get to a, a pretty familiar place here really quick, don't we? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of real life here where you get, you know, sometimes you meet somebody and you got some fire going back and forth and, it, you know, it, there's an attraction there. So it can turn. It can turn pretty quick. I'm a grown uh, man. No, I, I don't know, Will. There. I'll- all of my uh, all of my loves in my life have all started with a letter. So, uh, will you be my girlfriend? Well, <laughs> my wife, the first night I met her, she set my sandal on fire. So that's. I think I was there for that. You um, sure? Actually, that's funny that you just answered one of our hard hitting questions. I have a uh, opening line to Molly hard hitting question. We'll get there. Oh, uh, okay. Anyways, so now we're here. Shortly after Cisco leaves, Sergeant appears, and within minutes uh they are talking about dreams of going to new york and they're sharing a kiss at this point we believe dorothy has only slept with two men on that day um i could be i could be wrong but i have the i have the the fact checkers working on that for us as we speak cisco is her hurdling the cattle as three men watch over him we hear a dialogue the dialogue talks about how much money he's going to get paid for that this is the vigilante part, right? Hmm. But the you issue mean, is, the issue is, is that it's not referenced that they're vigilantes. It's not, it's not referenced that they're with the group or none of that. So we don't get any feeling of that. We just connect the pieces. I would have liked to seen that tied up a little bit. Um, yeah. It go might ahead. not even be the vigilante group. It just might be three guys who are, know each other and know that this is Cisco, the Cisco kid. So, could be the you wild know, west right right exactly so, so so we take it as that again it's just a it's just another it's just another hole plot hole um yep. in the story and there's a lot of them and again we're trying to give it the benefit of doubt so we move on they decide that they're going to go to the hills before cisco does and attempt to kill him and collect reward money as well as the money cisco just got from the cattle so there's about nine grand there right so the reward money for him is five thousand dollars and then the four thousand they get so they're 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 feasting they they go to this place where there's so many hiding spots right i'm being sarcastic uh the next scene is basically these three men climbing uh or riding the horses to the top of this mountain and in comes cisco kid they see him, a shot goes off, he falls off his horse, and we're thinking at this point, holy, holy crap, Cisco Kid just got shot, is he dead? What's going to happen here? Yeah, yeah, no, and you know, this is the movie I was kind of expecting, right? Like, I was thinking this was going to be the majority of the movie, um, and 
you know, so this scene was pretty cool. Like, not like I don't. He was shooting. I mean, minor complaints. He's shooting from the hip, right? Like he's he's down at his hip shooting these three guys that are like 40, 50 feet away. It's pretty impressive. I mean, he is Cisco kid, but yeah. um, yeah, you know, th- there's some minor stuff like that that I was you know, nitpicking, but it was a decent scene. It was shot well. I mean, every the audio was good. I, Everything here, this is what I was expecting from the movie. And it's just unfortunate that we didn't get more of it, I think. 100% agree. Like, yeah. I'm I'm interested in this because you've told me that this is what I'm supposed to be interested in. Um, yeah. It's it's a tale of two movies. We've talked about uh, Noah's Ark being that. Um, we've talked about this. this and, it, and again, maybe we are just in the early days of storytelling with this this medium you know yeah. um even though it's 30 40 years in that 30 40 years a lot of things have changed so they're they're constantly reinventing things and trying to figure it out um yeah which is why it's going to be so exciting when we get to movies that work um and that's not saying that any of these movies that we watched this year work because some of them did um mm-hmm. and and there's scenes in this that work so anyways cisco is hurtling the cat or i'm sorry cisco attempts to leave one of the three men um, that he shot. So they see him, they shoot him. He falls off his horse. They come down and he, like you said, he's shooting from the hip. He, I believe he kills two of them. Right. We, we he kills two of them and lets the third one go. And as a good movie does, we're going to get pay out of that, that man running <laughs> into the city saying, Hey guys, yeah. Cisco kid just shot two. Of, no, that's where the vigilante, right? So this would work. Yeah. There's right. moments like if he runs into a city and tells the vigilante groups, this guy's out of control and they're coming after him. Now we've got this exciting, like cat and mouse game by two different parties, but it just falls flat. Right. Yeah. No, that's exactly what I was thinking. You know, like I, I thought for sure this guy was going to be the the start of, you know, getting, getting the group riled up and we were going to start seeing some more scenes like this. And then it just didn't happen. It didn't happen. I want to ask this question before we get to the next couple, or maybe I'll just keep going and you tell me, but I'll ask the question first. When does act two stop? Mm. Do you believe it's the, the, do you believe the climax, which is the ending of this movie that Mm. do you believe that, that, that is act three is just so short and that act two is all of this filler in the middle. Like, do you, yeah, no, that's that's a good question. Um, I think I think it's pretty close to the act two is takes up the majority of the rest of the movie. Um, you might be able to say um, you might be able to say act two is or act three is when we have Tanya at the camp and she leaves. Okay. Um, that's the, that's where act three starts. But I mean, it's you know, I'm not sure they were thinking in in that kind of structure. I I think. And if they were, they just didn't execute it correctly. So, well, let's talk about that campsite. Tonya and the sergeant are now at the campsite. Um, I, I they just changed venues. Basically, he 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 didn't like the comfort of the house. He wanted to go out in nature on the same day, so they go out there. Mm-hmm. Tents are set up, so clearly that's where they're staying. Which that's that that much we know. Um, Tonya and sergeant are now at the campsite. Tonya finds a reward flyer in the tent for $5,000 for Cisco kid. This bothers her because she thought that he originally showed up to her house for her. Right. Mm -hmm. So now she's a little bothered by what she's just seen and she takes it personal, but like any Rico suave type men do, he quickly gets her back on his side. Um, and he changes her attitude. He promises her all the money, all the money to the reward to be hers. This is the yeah. moment in the movie where for me personally, where I said, okay, Dorothy is, is not in love with Cisco, which mm-hmm. you're hoping for Cisco. Cause he's the protagonist that at the end of this movie, he's going to get, get what he wants, gets, gets away sure. with it and gets the girl. So, yeah. Yeah. And he gets to go to Portugal where he <laughs> grew up as a kid and <laughs> Portugal. Hey. Everyone's speaking Spanish and English, and Portuguese speak Portuguese. So yeah, uh, I don't. I don't know, man. A, a little. You you just hope. I just hope for better. I feel bad for making you watch this one. 
<laughs> no, don't, don't do that. No, it's uh, great. This is great. I'm having no, fun. No, no, she, yeah. So you're really hoping still at this point that Cisco is going to get that, those cattle and he's going to get them sold. And then he's going to be able to reconcile with Tonya and, you know, she's going to see the error of her ways and you're going to have happily ever after. And clearly well, that's, that's a nice picture you just paint there, buddy. Um, but yes. unfortunately New York has been beating Portugal for forever and a day at the end of the camp scene. Uh, at the end of the camp scene, Tonya tells Sergeant that they need to get back to her place pronto to wait for Cisco because she's got a feeling Cisco's going to show up. Again, the timetable of this movie is not really given to us, but yeah. I think we, I think it's, I think it takes case, honestly, of course, over one day. I really do. So, because hmm. we don't see any night scenes until, yeah. till that's now. The only, my only argument here is that I think that's a failure on their part. I don't think this takes place on one day. I think the issue is it feels like it takes place on one day. We don't yeah. have any sort of sense of like how far he had to go to get the cattle. We don't know how long they've had those tents set up. They could have been out there for a week. Um, yeah. You know, you just, that's it's one of the flaws of the movie. Um, yeah. No, that's a, uh, yeah, it, it is. And it, it's unfortunate because we've talked about how this movie could work. Um, Oh, yeah. let's not let's not beat a dead horse here. Um, so Cisco arrives at Tonya's Tonya's house. Okay, we're we're set up for the finale here, and I will say, there's still some long scenes here, not as mm -hmm. long as earlier, but we're starting to get to a place where like this is getting my my peak interest is now coming right you've got me sold it's somehow i didn't think i was going to get there i wasn't going to care about this movie at all and i find myself caring so something why, yeah. why do you think that is is it because i've, I've stayed along for the ride that i want to see how it plays out like what's the answer to that question partly i think that's part of it um i think the other part is it's just hard to spend time with characters and not want to see like them succeed or them get to what get what they want or you know when there's real tension to see what's going to happen because by the time you get to the scene um you know you don't know exactly what's going to happen is cisco just going to start shooting everything up because he's so angry um is he gonna is he just gonna ride away and take his four thousand dollars for cattle and be gone um what's he thinking here so there's some real tension uh at this point yeah, and and somehow it starts building to a place where the tension was built pretty well. Um, so here we go. Cisco arrives to Tonya's house and sees Tonya kissing the sergeant goodbye and telling him now she never loves Cisco, just him. So again, in our one day theory, this is now man number three, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, in our multiple day theory, she she's. Re relaxed and rested a little bit in between. So good for her. Um, spoon feeding is a, a big theme in this movie, right? Um, especially yeah. at this part, you know, he's kind of, Cisco is peeking through the shadows a little bit and he sees Sergeant um, uh, talking and kissing and then hears Dorothy say, I've never loved you. Like, we're, we're, we've are we already been sold on that. We get it. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah. they feel the need to continue to continue to tell us that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's Cisco knows now, right? That's that's where the tension comes in. I think that's kind of key that Cisco's un unless you want to end the movie a different way, unless you want Cisco to just get sh get shot at the end of the movie. Um, but this this allows there to be options, right, for the viewer to not know exactly what's going to happen. So that, definitely important. Yeah. And if this was Harry Boma and this was our dancing daughters, right? He did that one. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I feel like that's what would happen. Cisco would get shot and we would be celebrating uh, <laughs> Sergeant Mickey Dunn and Dorothy or and, and Tonya. And I'd be left off wondering what the hell just happened to the end of my movie. So, uh, yeah, here's what happens. Cisco and Tonya now go into her house. He's now revealed that he's there, but this is after Sergeant has left. So nobody knows. Sergeant does not know he's there. He asks if she will leave with him tonight. He's panicking. He's testing her. Tell me, mm -hmm. basically pleading to her, tell me you were doing this just to get him to leave, right? And 
And she responds with, oh, no, I, we can't leave tonight. We can leave in the morning because the conversation that just took place between Tonya and the sergeant is, is to come back at 10 o'clock and you're going to kill Cisco for me. Yeah. And so she's setting up the trap. She's setting up the trap for Cisco. Cisco now knows that this is going on and yeah. he's begging her to leave tonight. She says she won't. So right there, that's the moment. That's the moment that he knows that she is not in love with him and that she's only in it for the money. Right. Exactly. No, that's a um, great point. Um, I really, that scene, you could, oh, you could see a little bit of his desperation, right? Like in this scene where it's like, oh man, I just love this girl. So I don't care what just happened. If I can be with her, if she chooses me in this moment. That That's all that matters. And, um, you know, I think that's, you know, that's a very relatable, I mean, not on the same scale. We're not all running around stealing cattle or anything like that, or robbing stagecoaches. But, you know, that's a real, like, thing that some of us have gone through in our lives where someone's hurt us. And it's like, we can overlook it if we can just, if they choose us in this moment. So. Oh, that's, yo, yeah. yeah. That hit me when you said it like that. Yeah. Yeah. Choose me in this moment and I will forgive you of all transgressions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fact check. Yep. This oh. is the one. Okay. Apparently this is the scene that must have been the reason why he won the Oscar because I can't figure <laughs> out other than this 10 minutes what it would have been. Yeah. I mean, other than just being able to pee heard <laughs> the whole movie, <laughs> like, Hey man, you nailed all your lines. Um, <laughs> he reminded me a character from, um, Oh my gosh, uh, the Princess Bride. My name is Roberto, or whatever he's. That's what he reminded you me of. My father. You killed my father. <laughs> well, what's All his right. Name? Oh man, that's gonna bug me. Bantam- Bantamont or Roberto Montoya. It, it, yeah. Oh man, it starts with an I. I'm not gonna try to say it because I'm gonna butcher <laughs> it. But maybe Tinkin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it reminded me of. I knew you would know that one. Um, okay. So let's set this up because it it does work. Before she can go, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped the stage. So Tonya now is trying to get him to stay the night with him so that he's there at 10 o'clock, right? So he says, Mm -hmm. I'm going to go outside and basically park my horse, all right? So now they needed an excuse to get him out of the building. And Tonya writes a letter to give to the old woman, which, okay. The old woman gets this letter and now she is running up to, to or to Cisco. Well, actually mm-hmm. she's in the cart. She's going to go deliver this letter. Actually, yep. they, they have an interesting dynamic, the old woman and, and, and Tonya, because she makes fun of her at every given moment, but it's almost like that's a plot point. that doesn't matter. Yeah. The old woman is getting ready to deliver this message and Cisco Caesar comes up and grabs the note from her and paraphrasing the note. Maybe you, you could do a better job than I did. Um, essentially what is said is that, uh, he's here. Um, I love you. You need to get here and kill him. Am I missing anything of real importance with the first section of that note? Um, no, I don't think so. I think this is when she tells him about the 10 o'clock, right? It's in this note. Okay, yes, this is when. Okay, I thought it was on the porch, but you're right. It's in this note. 10 o'clock, you need to get here. I think that's what the urgency is, is because when they when they part uh, uh, the sergeant and Tonya, when they part, it's like, hey, at some point he's going to be back and you'll need to come and kill him. So the urgency is because he's here, get here at 10 o'clock. Like that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's exactly what it was. So that, that sets up the anticipation now. And, and this is where through that and what we're about to reveal here soon, the anticipation even gets even heightened even more. Um, so obviously now the letter has been intercepted by Cisco and he changes it to say what he wants it to read. Now Mm -hmm. the front end of it is still, is still Tonya's, but the the mm-hmm. back end of it is him now telling 
Sergeant Mickey Dunn as if he was Tonya, what's going to be happening at 10 o'clock? So mm-hmm. what we see is, is that Tonya is going to be dressed in his clothes, his being mm-hmm. Cisco's, and yep. Cisco is going to be dressed in women's clothes. Yeah. And we hear all of this through the dialogue that the sergeant is having once the letter does get uh, rewritten and delivered to the sergeant from the old woman. We hear this right. as he's telling his colleagues. Mm-hmm. And that builds right. the anticipation anticipation for the climax of the film. Right. Yeah. And there's still like, there's still that tension too of like, where, <clears throat> where is it going to happen? Um, is, is um, the sergeant going to actually pull the trigger? Is he going to try to take him in alive? Um, like, is there going to be some sort of resolution here where this Cisco doesn't actually go through with it and panics at the last minute and they both end up dead. There's still all of that kind of on the table here. We just, it, they do do a really good job in this, you know, the third act here where you just don't know exactly what's going to happen. There's a lot of stuff on the table. Yeah, and I would have, again, it changes the movie if this happens, but what could have happened, just for just for a moment of doubt or intrigue, is now you can have a conversation happen between Cisco and Tonya Mm-hmm. That makes him once again, like even in a last ditch effort, not that he's trying to change her mind anymore, but now he's just letting her know, Hey, um, I loved you this much. You meant this much to me. This is what I, you know, and now we get this, like maybe a moment of doubt where Tony is thinking, maybe I shouldn't be doing this to kind of try to redeem her qual character yeah. as as uh, uh, Sergeant Mickey Dunn is now approaching the house, right? It, it, it adds suspense. It adds, oh, crap, maybe she's going to change, and now she's stuck. She can't get out of this thing. Or, you know, mm-hmm. maybe maybe they allude to that, and then she still goes through with it. I just think they could have played mm-hmm. with it so much more. There's so much room here. Yeah, and there was the little – there was a scene right in this section where he kind of goes through – his you know professions for love and i remember it pretty pretty well because there's that weird switch right um in the camera angle it's almost like they had to do a reshoot where you've got the one angle where he's doing this and then there's another like switch and it's like a 10 to 15 second scene where he gives a a little bit more dialogue explaining his love for her and then it goes back to the original angle so i don't know that could have been some technical issue but you know i I hear what you're saying, but I think they did a pretty good job of like setting Cisco's Cisco trying to give her a chance to change her change her mind here. Um, so, oh yeah, exactly. No, I think they did too. I just thought. Oh, okay. It, no, I thought I, I did too. I didn't think it was bad by any means because oh. I'm I'm invested. I just thought that it could have. And uh, when we get to the end here, I'll explain another scene I thought could have worked too. I just thought they could have built even more to get more out of these characters. You know what I mean? But what they did was they just made a decision. They just said that Tonya is not changing her mind. She's in it for the money. And which is totally fine because again, of all the things that didn't work with this movie, this stuff did. Um, We get to the final. Sergeant Mickey Dunn is here and he rides in. Cisco says he's, um, here he is. He tells Tonya that he is leaving and that she will always be an angel. I think that alludes to what you were talking about. He -hmm. walks out and rides off. But before he walks out and rides off, we see Sergeant Mickey Gunn. He's set up the gun by the tree. He's ready for it. He's waiting for Cisco to walk out in the woman's clothing. But Mm -hmm. first, out comes Tonya in the man's clothing, jumps on the horse and takes off. But us, the viewer, we know that that's actually Cisco who's just escaped once again, Mm -hmm. carefully. And then we get, which I thought was unexpected. It was unexpected. I knew we knew it was coming. I knew he was going to shoot her. Right. But the way they did this ending, he shoots her. She screams out and dies. And then we get the greatest line in the movie. (laughs) I mean, not just the greatest line, the greatest quote I've heard so far. After after uh, Sergeant Mickey Dunn is 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 killed, Tonya, you see Cisco 
uh, just kind of off in the distance on his horse saying <laughs> her flirting days are over. It's time for her to settle down. <laughs> oh man. So funny. And he could have won the Oscar off that one liner alone. Um, yeah. And that's the movie. And then the movie's over. I, yeah. I remember watching this thinking, holy crap, this was awesome. That was awesome. Yeah, no, the ending is the ending is very good. Um, I, I thought they did a really good job with it. Um, you know, I wondered, like, I wondered if there might have been an opportunity here for some a little bit more action, like um, where, you know, the something goes wrong and then you get a bit of a chase scene or something where the sergeant figures out what what's going on. Uh, and you get a little bit more here where you get a little, another showdown, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of heat here, um, with, you know, De Niro and and their, their last scene in that movie is just an all time great scene. So like you, you have, I had that in the back of my mind and thought, Hey, there's, there's more here on the table where you could have got a little bit more from the two leads, the two main characters. And the ending works. They did a good job with it, but I just wondered if there was more on the plate. I think there's one scene, five seconds. He shoots, she falls, she's revealed. We go back to Mickey Dunn, who is doing all this because he loves her, mm-hmm. right? Or he likes her. I don't know. He loves her. He's infatuated with her. He, he's got to. He wants to kill and get the reward money and do his job. But he's also, you know, he's he's she's the flavor of the month right now because he's he's also married. Which right? Well, she looks just enough like her, like his wife. <laughs> yeah, to work. yeah. Which I thought in the beginning, I thought maybe that was there to play with us. I wasn't sure, but but no. <laughs> if if we in that moment, yeah. he shoots, we hear the scream, she falls, and he, if we go back to him and get his reaction there. Yeah, that that's so much more powerful because now he realizes that he just killed her. We don't get any payoff on that. None. He kills her. She's dead. Cisco is evaded or eluded the whole thing. And that's it. I mean, there's no payoff on that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I think that's a good point too. And I think that just kind of gives you the overall sentiment of the movie. uh, Why we come out of this as being disappointed, right? Is there just, there was just shortcuts. (laughs) Well, there was long cuts taken where you just, (laughs) you don't get like, you don't get any of that connective tissue to make you like think like, Hey, you know, these two characters could have had more interactions on screen so that you felt, you felt more about them, but they, there's just, there's just not. So, and I mean, uh, between Mickey and Cisco, if they had had more than just that opening scene where you get something in this last act where they interact, but you just never do. That's a great point. They're literally not on scene together again mm-hmm. the cat and chase or the cat and mouse chase yep. it never gets there it's set up but we never get there yeah right. yeah yeah that's a good point interesting yeah and i mean it just goes back to you know you watch you watch westerns now stuff that they've done over the last 20 years you just get this kind of stuff so um you just maybe it's more about our expectations than anything else but um, I think, you know, it, for me, it just felt like a flaw of the movie. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that was like my big question to you was, does this film deserve a higher rating because it was taking on the beginning stages of something? This movie, you know, crawled so that other movies like Hostels could, could run and fly. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I feel like that's a cop out to, because by saying that, you know, <sighs> I, I get it. It's the first ever talkie outside. That's that's a big thing. I don't want to underplay that. It just seems like if you're gonna take on that that um, that type of challenge, you flush out these things a little more. But again, that's hindsight as a movie viewer that's been spoiled in the twenty twentieth and twenty first century. So yeah, yeah, no, and that's you know ultimately, I I didn't think this movie was very good. Um, but I think there's enough here that it was, I keep kind of falling back on this and maybe it's kind of a crutch, but I, th- I was glad to have watched it because I do think that, you know, with the, with it being so technical 
and it's sounding so good. Like I didn't, I didn't ever once think yeah. like, Hey man, this, this doesn't sound good. So it's falling short of its main goal. Um, so I, you know, I think there's redeeming stuff here and that bookend nature, there was still stuff in this and it was funny. Like there was funny parts in this and it, it was crude. Yeah. <laughs> there was yeah. a lot of, you know, a lot of generational, like, uh, what, one generation's attracted to is not the same as the other, the new generation and crude humor, but you know, it was, there was still some funny stuff in here. So. Well, the, the crude humor, humor with the, uh, like, you know, them talking about, uh, um, fat, fat women, right. Mm -hmm. The old woman, she gets her, she gets her pushback on that, you know, mm -hmm. When she's talking to the, to the, to the skin, there's nothing on you, dear. There would take three or four of you to be me, you know, like, so like yeah. they do come back to it. So there is, you're right. There is some things here that, that do work. Um, I, I found the spoon feeding part where the, uh, uh, the sergeant is reading the letter mm -hmm. to the, the, the people or to his, mm -hmm. his, his colleagues. I found that to yeah. be hilarious. He just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like well, they, they, they spoon fed read. us and then spoon fed us again. Yeah. They probably couldn't read. He had to read it out loud. They read it. He read it out loud. And then after he left, the one guy turns to the other guy and goes, do you see what's going on? <laughs> He's going to go kill Cisco. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, so, God. yeah. Uh, any, any other things to take away? Uh, what was your, what was your rating of this movie? Let's get Will's letterbox rating. Yeah, so I ended up giving this a three, um, and I think it's totally redeemed by that that last scene. Um, you know, I I was frustrated at the pacing. I was frustrated at not having more you know action scenes. But I think that last scene, and then also trying to remember that what they were trying to do here is one of the first times they were doing this, which is yeah. capturing that sound. So I, I ended up giving it a three. Yeah, we see this movie 10 years from now. This movie drops from a three to probably gets cut in half, right? Uh, or maybe two or something yeah. like that. But, like, it doesn't it doesn't hold a three 10 years later, right? Right, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay, man. Hard-hitting questions. I only have two of them because oh. you're right. This whole this movie could have been 100 of them. Uh, <laughs> these are just some of the funny ones that I stood out to me. Hard-hitting question number one, and this is <laughs> – even funny because of your current hair status, but uh, oh, no. do you do you remember the last time Will you were in a barber shop chumming it up with a with a local stranger, and you tapped his gun? <laughs> uh, no, it's been a while. Uh -huh. <laughs> the last time I was in a barber shop was when I was still delivering mail. There's a good oh, old barber really? shop on one of my routes that I got to <laughs> that I held down, um, but. <laughs> Yeah. Fair no. enough. Fair enough. Guns in a while. Um, this one was so quick. It might, it might not be that funny, but it was to me. Um, you might not even picked up on it. I don't know, but was your opening line when you met Molly, uh, you've got more in a minute than Lillian Russell has in an hour. <laughs> I did hear that. I don't know who Lillian Russell is. So I think that's part of the issue. <laughs> <laughs> me either, but, it, but Molly heard it and she loved it. <laughs> oh man i was trying to think of a hard-hitting question for you i didn't write anything down but um is tonya a gypsy like yeah what, I, that's what is her character like i is she supposed to be i know they're kind of poking fun at like at different cultures they say foreigner a couple times but it's so hard because she's got this awful accent so i just is she supposed to be like a you know, is she supposed to be Mexican? Is she supposed to be like Spanish? Is she supposed to, dude? What is going on there? <laughs> I am so glad you brought this up because I was kind of torn at times. I'm like, are they in Mexico or are they in Italy? Like it, the barber yeah. felt Italian to me. Like mm -hmm. you know what I mean? He mentioned Sicily. He oh, mentioned he sending okay. money back to Sicily. So you know, he was okay. Italian. He was oh. Italian. See, okay, at least yeah. they caught that. <laughs> I missed that part of it. Yeah, I just felt like, man, in this little town of old Arizona, they they're they're very diverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. No, I just that was the other thing that I couldn't kept taking me out of the movie, right? So yeah, just the well, awful accidents. The yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, if we never find out that uh, uh, Sergeant Mickey is going, I, I'm assuming home to New York. 
which how is that plan ever going to pan out with his wife there? You know, that, that of all the plot holes in that movie, if you, you, <laughs> you could have just took away the fact that he had a wife. Hmm. It didn't advance the story at all, right? If he's just a second guy in love with this girl and then at the end he kills the girl he's in love with, it's a better movie. Yeah. No, this is true. So, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, Because he would feel for him at the end. You'd be like, oh, my God, at least the girl that nobody likes, she, I mean, you know, the viewers, at least she got hers in the end, but now we feel bad for Sergeant. But maybe we're supposed to not feel bad for him because he has a wife. Maybe we're supposed to be mm-hmm. left – with just the idea that Cisco is the hero of this movie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the flaw. <laughs> we, we just don't know. <laughs> um, well, that was 1928 uh, in old Arizona with uh, Irving Cummings and um, Raul Walsh. And uh, as Will said, it was nominated for a bunch of Oscars. It actually won for Best Actor, which congratulations Warner Baxter I'm you know I'm not taking anything away from you it just uh, it felt like uh, there was probably some other performances out there that maybe stood the time let me ask this question we watched five other movies will would you have given it to anybody else of any of the other movies that we've seen as far as best actor oh best actor I was gonna say it, it's not it's easily not the best performance because we watched uh, Mario Passion Falconetti of- in the passion yeah. of yeah yeah. So, I mean, uh, Charlie Chaplin was this year in the circus. I thought he was pretty great um, on in his movie. Um, I mean, of the the movies we watch, it's probably Charlie Chaplin, and then and then um, Wayne, right? Wayne, uh, blanking on his last name there, Warner Warner Baxter um, from this movie because you know you can't really. Can't really give the acting award to Walt Disney for uh, Steamboat Willie there. So <laughs> probably not. Hey, you know what though? That's a great idea. This is what we'll do because we were kind of trying to figure out what our path was going to be. So mm. every five years we're gonna do our ranking list of best movies, right? But I think what we mm. should do at the end of every deck or at the end of every year, let's do it. Let's do an Oscars. All right. Oh, okay. We'll do a best actor, best uh, best actress. We'll do best movie. Um, and then uh, we can even throw in a couple other things in there just to make it fun. We'll do the Oscars at the end of, you know, every every year. Okay. No, that'd be great. Want to cool. do it right now? <laughs> We're at sure. the end of the year. <laughs> uh, I'll have to uh, kind of put on my thinking cap. I wanted to do a little trivia, see if you could remember all the director's names for these these oh, six no. films we've watched so far. But we'll get there. Uh, let's, include, let's include the Jazz Singer. 19, well, no, this is 1928. Jazz Singer is done. Um, we just talked about best actor, you know, off top of my head, as far as main protagonist roles, right. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, we had our issues with Noah's Ark. Um, Mm -hmm. we had our issues. Not, Not, there wasn't many issues with that. I thought there was, well, it was, it was, it was more our dancing daughters, right? Noah's Ark was pretty good. Uh, our dancing daughters was the was the issues with. Yeah, the, I think Noah's maybe Ar- maybe that makes sense. Maybe Warner Baxter is the answer. Well, that's I mean for me it would probably have to be Chaplin because he's that's oh. nineteen twenty eight. Um, I think he he's probably the clear best male performance from nineteen twenty eight. You're uh, right, and then you got Mario Falconetti for female lead. We're for totally sure. in agreement. Totally in agreement. Um, Give me so. your best picture. Uh, Passion Joan Dard, for I sure. Agree. Yeah, yeah. It, the head, head and Tails above the other movies. I mean, The Circus is a very good movie, um, but not on the same level. It's yep. it's just not. No, and I've actually started my my list ranking on uh, Letterbox, so it's oh, okay. public, but don't go and look at it because I I it's oh. just to help me kind of keep it clean. So when we do our rankings order or episode, gotcha. I don't want you to know what it is. So. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've got one on there too. So. Oh, do you? Okay. I won't pay yeah. any attention. So. Okay. Um, all right, man. That's our second year completed. I know it kind of cheated 1927, but 1927 in the books, 1928 in the books, uh, just quick notes on 1929 and what you're, we're going to do the draft episode for our viewers. That'd be next. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I'm expecting us to get more and more into like talkies. Um, I'm kind of excited for that. Not that, you know, 
I'm sure we'll watch a few more silent films um, before we're said and done, but I, I'm excited to see, kind of see what happens. I know there's some, some bangers as the kids say in uh, the 1930s. So um, we're, you know, we got one more year in the twenties. We'll see what we see, what we have, but um, I don't know. I will, we'll have to start thinking about things as we go, because I think we're going to get into a start soon, start getting into some space where we're, not watching everything that we want to watch. Um, Yeah. And it's probably going to happen quick. So. (laughs) Yeah. Because if you think, yeah, you're right. And that's going to be hard because uh, Mm -hmm. we're going to feel like we're kind of cheating our own project. You know what I mean? But in order to accomplish the project, we have to, we have to kind of keep it at a pace that makes sense. Um, Right. You said something to me off air about the great depression is coming up. Mm -hmm. You know, what, is some of what what does the div, i guess the um what's the word i'm looking for what does it look like on the front end of the great depression with these movies versus the back end like what how does the mm. this these these stories kind of um um i don't want to say develop i don't want to say tra- transpire but you know what i mean like what does it look like yeah no i'm definitely fascinated to see um what we how the stories shift um, because, you know, we're not that far away from, you know, Hitler taking power either. So kind of, there's right. going to be a, a broader um, propaganda type. I, I know there's a lot of like history from the thirties and early forties about that propaganda kind of leaking in before movies when you went to the theater. So it'd be yeah. interesting to see if that kind of starts to take shape take shape as well um i pr- we probably won't see that next year but starting in the early 30s we'll probably start to see um we'll 29 will be nice to see if there's anything we can find that kind of uh still has that roaring 20s feel and yeah. then as we start to shift to like what is the great depression look like um and if the stories kind of shift with it so and i'm also going to be interested in looking at if we start getting repeat directors and seeing mm-hmm. how their uh, has uh, kind of like their vision has been impacted by you know society's events and what's taken place, and to see if they've evolved or if they're kind of still stuck making the same thing, or even maybe they're trying to get us to escape back to a time period where everybody yeah. was happy. You know what I mean? So it's going right. to be interesting to see if we get repeat directors on that front or on that front. And also, right. this 1929. You're right. This kind of feels like the calm before the storm a little bit. Um, and it, and, and it, that's kind of a surreal, surreal feeling to like, these people have no idea what's getting ready to come down the barrel for them. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, you're going to see, it's kind of like seeing all the happy smiling faces right before this horrible, horrible thing happens. So. Right. Yeah. And I know we start getting into some um, Hitchcock here at some point because he's making films already. Um, but you know, some of the ones that are a little bit more well known are going to be right around the corner too. And that's one of those directors that you hear about. And if you haven't, you know, haven't done a lot of like film study, you might not have seen a lot of his films. So for me, I I know that's one of my lacking areas. So we're, we're getting really close here to some of the, the, the people who changed the game. And, um, I'm, I'm very, very interested to see how that goes. Me too, and I will say this about Hitchcock. My favorite Hitchcock film, which I know you're going to – I think you're just going to be obsessed with it. You're going to love it, Um, and we'll get to it. But it's uh, The uh, Rear Window. Have you ever seen Mm. that one? I No, it's been on my watch list for like 10 years. It's it's so good. It's so good. Um, It's one of those that like – you're just going to find out why Hitchcock, even to this day – is because he's just you're watching something and you're like how the hell was this made then like how is he getting this this perspective how does he think to do this when nobody of his you know surrounding colleagues or even thought of it yet for in and it won't it won't be in the zeitgeist of hollywood consistently for like another 10 years so right yeah pretty impressive stuff from him um all right buddy we went a little long today uh, hour 17 it needed to be done um, but, Hopefully, uh, the, yeah, we can for you folks. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, I hope you guys are following us. This is a uh, seventh or eighth episode. We are enjoying what we're doing and um, hopefully you continue to come along for the ride. So Will, last words. Um, just call me little rabbit, everyone. <laughs> yeah, I'm right. You're, to... ste you're steamboat Willie from now on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. We will see you guys on down the road. All right. We'll see you.